Dane and Derek is an uncensored, unfiltered podcast. You can find content warnings in the episode description. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Dane and Derek. Uh, this week, we once again have our good friend Clara on the show. Say hi, Dane, and say hi, Clara. Uh, hi. I was just being polite. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I get so stressed out when a podcast has a guest on and the guest like immediately starts to like, doesn't know how to act, which frankly was me on the last episode. I'm like immediately accidentally talking over you guys. I bet that like whoever's listening, like, this bitch is already oh, talking no, over them. No, no. Just a little yeah, bit of a <laughs> adjustment were, period. Yeah, no, you did great. I was, we, we were the ones who were rusty. <laughs> yeah. I, for, for those who haven't put it together yet, um, I went to law school, and these are my first two episodes back. Yeah, um, was, what two and a half months since we last re- actually recorded? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the last time they heard um, heard us like chatting, uh, I never would have said something like, "This does not constitute legally bi- legal advice." <laughs> um, these are things I need to say now. Yep. And to that point, this this week's episode is not legal advice. It is, in fact... Who knows? Yeah. Maybe, but <laughs> Let's get litigious. Litigious about <laughs> the litigious of Zelda. Wow. <laughs> liturgy. The liturgy of Zelda. The liturgy. Wait, isn't that something religious? I Liturgical? I don't know. Uh, Probably. That's an mm. SAT word there. Yeah. But... Oh, anyway, man. yeah, we want to talk about Zelda. Zelda, which yeah. is like... I'd say it's arguably one of Clara's favorite things. Absolutely, yes. I, I thought you were about to say arguably one of Clara's favorite games, Derek, and I was like, <laughs> this is an ar- this is an arguable. Then you said things argument. in general, <laughs> like you you put it up into a, a a broader echelon. I was like, yeah, okay, fine, fine, that's that's acceptable. Um, yeah, Clara, have you played them all? Like, I, and I just mean like mainline. I'm not talking about like Zelda Monopoly or whatever. <laughs> No, I haven't played that one, but it'd be really fun. I've played... It's crucial to understanding the time break. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, no. That is a deep cut reference Everybody that a lo- not a lot of people... Polygon video Brian David Gilbert oh. did about the did Zelda you... timeline. It's, that, uh, it's a riot. That might be my most favorite bit of Zelda content. And I'm sorry. Which is great. No, yeah. that's a great one. That is a great touchstone. Yeah, yeah it, it's going to be funny. We're trying to like, trying to keep it kind of snappy, keep it kind of short and sweet on this episode. Uh, I gotta Dane go has study to for go, finals. Has to go do good t- things, but like <laughs> this topic I don't, for me. I, if you, all right, don't Dane's argue. A nerd. Don't argue. I have to. I have to. Go, I have to go study about like contracts let's not, let's not call it good at stop least arguing, morally ambiguous anyways We're continue continue sorry stop arguing. <laughs> instigator i am caffeinated the latte <laughs> is kicking in gonna, okay let's put put the energy elsewhere yeah the, the thing is with uh yeah zelda as a franchise as a topic if you get me going and give me the time i could go i could feel fill a handful of podcasts but um we very yeah. well, well might. Anyways. The, ooh, the, yeah, the ones that I've played, um, I, the ones that I have not played, I haven't played more than like an hour of the first one, haven't played the second one, or Link to the Past, haven't played Link's Awakening. See, the thing is, those were, those were the ones where I was like either not born or was a baby. Um, mm. And then I, I have finally played Ocarina of Time now. That I was a total Zelda poser. I had not played that one until uh, like two years ago. Um, I my first one was Wind Waker, sitting in Christina's mm. basement mm. playing Wind Waker mm. in uh, elementary school, and then Phantom Hourglass on the DS, and then kind of blossomed from there. Gotcha. Okay, Derek, which ones have you played? So. Prior to playing Breath of the Wild, which is the only Zelda game I've played, I played the first 15 minutes of Twilight Princess on a copy of that game that I borrowed from our friend Christina for five years. I borrowed that, (laughs) and I only played 15 minutes, and I'm so sorry, Christina. Um, But yeah, I've only played Breath of the Wild um, front to front. Yeah, 
front to front, and I started my second playthrough. Nice. Um, and other, otherwise, most of my exposure to The Legend of Zelda has actually been through the once... Uh, eh, yeah, to the popular web series, The Legend of Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually think I know what that is. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's about a guy that gets sucked into the Legend of Zelda and has oh named God. Neil from Trenton, New Jersey. That sounds From silly. Trenton, New Jersey. That's from hilarious. 2006 to 2009. Bitty. It aired on Spike TV from oh, no. Sandy Parikh of Guild of the Guild fame um, or Desi Quest, <gasps> if you know that TTRPG show. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so most of my exposure to it is through that web series and Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, I have uh, Breath of the Wild was the second Legend of Zelda game I ever played. Um, as Derek put it, front to front. Um, uh, I've also played the recent remake of Link's Awakening, front to front. Um, and the first one was the first one. Uh, my uncle uh, loved, 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 loved it. And so I played it because I wanted on like a Wii emulator when I was like 11 or 12 because I just wanted to know what the deal was. And I want to be very clear. I had a big old walkthrough and I and, and, like I was following it because I was like, this is hard. Oh, it's Jesus. so hard. Yeah, you, um, you need a walkthrough. Yeah. The first one is so, especially like obtuse. Definitely obtuse. Too. like there's like the there's like a dungeon in it where like you have to bomb a wall to go into a room that is not on the map and i'm like that's such a dick move the whole game if you could <laughs> see the see if you had the map and you could see it then you knew that oh i should bomb here but that's just it's anyways um <laughs> i cannot even imagine being a child in like the 1980s with no internet and being like, no, literally, that's how you do it. I, it's it's horrible. Just trial and anyways, error. Like it's yeah. Great Depression. <sighs> no guide. Yeah. No guide. No guide. Any, anyways, yeah. No. So that's that's my experience. Um, I have like a lot of like adjacent like legend of zelda is kind of like really ubiquitous like it's kind of like really? star wars or star trek it's like just one of those things especially in video game culture that you just end up bumping into mm-hmm. um no matter what you do so like i made jokes about like the brian david gilbert videos about zelda mm-hmm. um because he did a breath of the wild cooking one that i also adore mm-hmm. um and like i own like a legend of zelda cookbook because my partner really likes especially breath of the wild and oh, so cute. i cook things for her out of that sometimes um yeah cooking song when you cook them god i wish um <laughs> god I'm, I'm not that rhythmic while i do my cooking i need to get on it um yeah anyways but as much as i've enjoyed the games and i still super feel them in like things i love way more like for example uh i actually think especially coming from like the very first legend of Zelda as like a touchstone. I think there's like a direct line you can draw between that and like Elden ring, for example. Yes. Um, and so like, I, I like, I kind of circle around it, but it's not the thing that lives in my heart. Um, Mm -hmm. in the same way that it totally lives in, in Clara's heart. Yeah. So it like, I, I live in it. Like one of, one of my friends uses the phrase, uh, so-and-so is where my brain lives. Like this franchise is where my brain lives. Like it's kind of, it's kind of, it's what I go back to. It's sort of like a comfort space. And it's totally like, it's uh, like a franchise that, um, has been in most of my life like i started playing these games as a young kid and like as a result it's sort of like so comforting to go back to like i i always loved the games they were always influential on me but especially um in 2017 uh i had like the darkest time of my life um and i like absolutely needed coping mechanisms and that is Mm -hmm. right when breath of the wild came out and uh i just like totally zeroed in and it became a like uh, certifiable uh hyper fixation and it just like it totally lended itself to it because it was something i already had a base knowledge of but there is just so much content for it and it's like mm-hmm. it's just, there's sort of like a inner child aspect to it too so it, it's like uh very important to me 
can you can you speak to why like what is it like what are the bits like mm. you know like i can like for example i can point to um like certain heroic aspects of star wars say where um my brain occasionally lives rent free um is it like an aesthetic thing is it like i'm wondering i'm curious aesthetic plays a huge part of it for sure i think um something i really like about the series is um how the art direction changes drastically um, between games. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the, the willingness to totally visually reinvent uh, the same formula is like very exciting to me. Cause like uh, other, like, you know, big legacy IPs, like they, they sort of have the incentive to like stay recognizable, like sort of stay within a visual style and like, Zelda games, Zelda characters do stay recognizable, but like just the approach, the artistic approach that they take from game to game is so uh, diverse and different. And like Wind Waker, especially like that was that was like the formative game for me. And that game visually is just bulletproof. Like it has aged so well. Like they. Uh, they took a lot of chances with um, mm-hmm. how to visually portray it. So, like, yeah, the aesthetics are absolutely uh, play a huge part in why they really resonate with me. I think, like, in terms of story, um, the stories tend to be pretty rudimentary. Um, so, like, you know, there's kind of... But it's a fairy tale. It's a myth. It is, yes. It, it, and it, it gets a, told over and over again. It's yeah, yeah, it's a legend. It's, you know, you can think of it as, like, <laughs> legends in actual human history, like, uh, get retold and sort of warp over time. And, like, there are recurring characters um the but that like manifest in very different ways so like it totally does feel like uh yeah they're fairy tales they're little myths so i think Mm -hmm. even though like when you are looking at the actual building blocks they're pretty simple and they are also like they are secondary to the gameplay like these are action adventure games um with a story kind of uh wrapped around it or sort of interspersed uh depending on the game uh which like yeah the uh let's think uh the earlier 3d games in particular like ocarina of time majora's mask wind waker um there is this sort of like separation of gameplay and story where you're playing the game, you're pushing blocks around, um, then you get to a cutscene and you watch a little cinematic, like you put the controller down. This is something that I think about with video games a lot in general, is like, how are they telling the story and how much do they draw from film language? How yep. much are they trying to be a film, frankly? And I think mm-hmm. like Zelda games are a um, like definitely example of the... Um, the kind of status quo of uh, how stories get played or portrayed in games where like, okay, I'm watching a mini movie now. Um, I put down my controller, pick it back up. Mm-hmm. I'm pushing blocks again. And, like games yep. try to do. Um, there's so many different ways of telling stories in games. Uh, I think quick time events uh, are, in my opinion, a very clunky way of trying to mix gameplay and uh, cinema and story. But they yeah, just, like, not a. I do not feel not more engaged by pressing X repeatedly. Um, no. This is actually, this is funny. This is sort of like um, uh, trending out of Zelda and into just like a thought I have in general, but maybe this can be sort of fun to touch on, but just like how stories get uh, portrayed in games. Because this is something that made me notice this was um, funny enough when I was watching Singing in the Rain and watching... Mm. um, Oh, it was White Christmas, I think. Like, these early movie musicals um, that uh, would have a story, would have the, like, central plot, this, like, often a romance, often, like, a, like, oh, save the cabin kind of thing. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And then uh, the story would pause for a second while a uh, musical number would happen. I'm thinking of specifically in White Christmas, the choreography song or like uh, uh, Mandy, like the like the one that's just Mandy, where it's Uh mostly dancing even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. And like in the case of Singing in the Rain in particular, it's like, you know, those were songs that uh, MGM uh, already owned. I believe so. Um, and they're like, uh, we would like to use this in, in a movie. So it is cobbled together. Like that is part of it. But like movies from that era in general, movie musicals um, are still um, hewing really close to how stories are portrayed on the stage. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially like vaudeville or variety shows that like early film grew out of, like you would have skits, then you would have musical numbers that were not related. And I think like, as movies are starting to, um, we're starting to, uh, just be able to explore how stories can be told just, uh, in a way that movies can, I think we totally saw that and see that with video games as well. Like sort of a, like a nascent form of media that, um, in terms of storytelling, uh, only has reference points from other forms of media at beginning. So I think that is why, uh, from my perspective, um, so many games, the main way they tell their story is through little mini movies interspersed. And Mm -hmm. like, so it just really excites me when like, uh, we start to see like new advances in, um, ways that stories can be told only through gaming or just like little story elements like have either of you played undertale it's fine. We're, we're going to undertale we're talking about undertale uh not yet not yet so we may we you may not have enough reference here but i was i was going to actually pull out an interesting point is that like one cool thing about the legend of zelda though is because of its age and its consistency of release without like being like a Ubisoft game where it's like, and we're going to release one this year and next year and the next year um, is that it actually kind of flag posts like signpost things like the original Zelda is actually really good at telling a story mm-hmm. um, in its own way without, yeah, without doing any, any, like you never stop to put on a movie, you know? Mm-hmm. Um and like Breath of the Wild almost comes back around to it. Yes, yeah, that was a huge part of the success of Breath of the Wild is how they like mm-hmm. uh, brought in elements from the very first game, like really going back to like what was working then. While also including cutscenes that for the first time in a very very long time I had cared about the mm. the memories because I'm, I was I'm like glad oh. you cared about them. <laughs> I cared about the memories a lot. I was like, I went around and I found this. And yes, I would very much like to watch my little memory now. Thank you. I worked very hard to figure out where the fuck to take this picture. Mm-hmm. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like real quick on, on Undertale. I've only oh. listened to Megalovania. That's a good song. song. Yeah. Uh, I've played rhythm games with, with Megalovania. It's a tough song. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, uh, all, all I was going to say uh, with Undertale, this, um, this is a little bit of story. Um, it happens right at the beginning, so I don't think it's spoilers to say but um at the end of the tutorial of the game Mm -hmm. there's the character that has led you through the tutorial her name is toriel um and in order to finish out the tutorial you have to fight her um she does not want you to leave the safety of the tutorial area um so she like you have to you have to fight her but she does not want to fight you she doesn't want to hurt you so the way that fights happen in undertale it's like a little um bullet hell um yeah a little mini shmub um so you have your little cursor and she has her little attacks that um you know, move across the field, but her attacks, um, as the game goes on, physically avoid you. They avoid your little cursor because she does not want to hurt you. And that, for me, that's a perfect little, 
um, example of like that is the gameplay. That is the battle gameplay, mm-hmm. and that is a story element that is happening um, directly integrated into the gameplay. Mm. So that that was my little my okay. little mini example. Yeah. But um, yeah, with Breath of the Wild story, um, I uh, yeah. Speaking of filling up entire seasons of podcasts, I could go on and on. But I think in terms of just like in the grand scheme, it's an ambitious story. It is so ambitious, um, and I have problems with it. Um, it makes me glad to hear that you care about it, because like not that was not everyone's reaction to it. Mm-hmm. I care deeply, but um, <laughs> I think it's. Uh, like the story is so beholden to um or limited by the format of an open world game um cuz there's there's the story that's happening uh in the time period that you're playing and then mm-hmm. there are the memories that you get that happened 100 years previous mm-hmm. um And uh, due to the nature of the open world game, you might not get any story uh, before you finish the game. You could, like, a player could feasibly avoid uh, almost all of the story um, and then just beat the boss. Um, And that, like, that is a valid way to play it. Like, that is how the game was designed, to have, like, just a, like, gigantically broad um, way of playing it. But um, in terms of... uh, the the memories in particular um being scattered across the world um in order to get all of them uh yeah you need to have the gumption to like go and find them you have to want to go and find them um and obviously plenty of players are going to be stumbling upon them accidentally as well um so as a result the memories have to kind of be oriented around um most players not finding all of them so Mm -hmm. as a result a lot of the memories are very repetitive um Mm. like so many of them are just like zelda's like how do i awaken my powers oh no i can't do this this sucks like at least four or five of them that is the gist of the memory because like that that is the core struggle of our title character so obviously it matters but it um it just it kind of undercuts the substance of them if you're gonna like really look at the story on a whole but like that is just kind of it had to serve the open world nature it had to um they had to account for how players were gonna play totally i will i will push back on the undercutting by one one reading that i had when i mm. when i played um so the one thing that like I compare Breath of the Wild to Elden Ring a lot because they are clearly in conversation with each other. Yes. Um, I connect harder with Elden Ring because it's my character. Um, yes. I don't have the history with Zelda, so I do not have quite a, like a personal attachment to Link. I don't have a personal attachment to Zelda beyond my enjoyment specifically in Breath of the Wild. Um, whereas like, because I'm a big D and D player, I can really invest, especially if I get to take the time to make my own character. Um, huh. yes. but when I, when I was playing Breath of the Wild, I got sold on Link and Zelda's relationship mm. because of the repetitiveness. Because suddenly I was like, yeah, this guy hung out with this this person. This like They spent all this time together and this thing came up over and over again in this like much more human way that it didn't, she doesn't just mad, just solve it. It's a problem. They have problems repeatedly. Like, with each other, you know, and I thought that that was, that was very human. Um, though, yeah, it does make it like a kind of a single note on that case. Yes. I, that, that makes me really happy. (laughs) I'm really glad that that was your response to it. I think like the level of attachment that I have to the characters, I, I do still technically agree in terms of like how the story hits for me. I think I'm sort of thinking in like, in a broader space of how your average player is gonna connect Mm -hmm. with it um but also like i can't 
I can't speak for everyone. It's more accurate for me to be able to speak for myself. Um, question, do you see them romantically together? Um, yes. In the end, I do. Not in like a... Just in a, in a more of a long-term slow burn sort of way. Mm. Um, and mainly because I personally like the, the con- not the conflict, but the interesting dynamic that shows up between Zelda and Mifa in particular of how I just pumped thinking, my fist. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, because, and my reasoning behind that is because the story of Breath of the Wild is done in broad impressionistic strokes. Yeah. You get to fill in a lot of blanks. For me, my the blanks that I filled in there is like these two people have feelings for the same person. He's clearly not being super expressive about it to either of them. They still need to be able to work together, support each other, and kind of be above it. Mm. Um, and that's a cool story for them, uh, regardless of how romantic things work out with Link. Mm. And and I think that there's a more interesting story of the three of them that could show up had they had to resolve feelings while Mifa was alive, oh right? God. Yes, that yeah. <laughs> you're. Yeah, you are definitely making my synapses fire. I like. I have such a complicated relationship with Zelda and Link as a ship in like every iteration of them. Like early on for me, it was definitely like my um, being like just deep in compulsory heterosexuality. Like they were sort of a manifestation of that. I was like, well, yeah, they they should get together, right? Because the boy and the girl should get together right and i like i Mm -hmm. would not look below the surface and like with some of the previous iterations like looking back like it is way more interesting if they do not have um a romantic connection and like in a lot of them like zelda is way out of link's league like in in twilight princess he like he's this peasant boy she's a princess they share like maybe 20 lines of dialogue with each other and then at the end they're like peace out which like i think is kind of funny um right that is obviously huge different in breath of the wild sorry what were you saying oh i was actually gonna say that that's kind of like the the implication of of the first game isn't more there's no more reason for them to be together than any other like like fairy tale yeah like boy and girl next you know, to each other they are next to each other and so like for me i'm like i don't i don't necessarily read it that way in that mm-hmm. one at least because it's hard to read much of anything in that one. Yeah. But and like yeah, Breath of the Wild in particular, I I feel similarly where like it is kind of a tough sell for me to imagine the two together romantically um requited or otherwise um and that is again because i think it is a lot more interesting if it is not romantic because what we see mm-hmm. especially at the beginning of um like when they first meet, when they first have to be traveling together, she hates his guts. Yeah. She hates him. She is resentful because he represents what she cannot do. He is this like prodigy. He um, is in full touch with his powers, and that is what she's trying to do. She cannot unlock her magic. It's a huge, and she doesn't want to. She's doing it against her will. She just wants to study. She wants to grow plants. She wants to look at robots, and she can't do that. So he represents this insecurity to her which is like so upsetting and obviously they have to like they get kind of forged in fire they have to travel together at first she is really resentful that he even has to go with her as time goes on she like she clearly just needs a friend and she's like okay here's this guy and like sometimes it's really heartbreaking to see um the cutscenes where like she is just like pouring her heart out um and getting nooch getting neutral from link like he's giving Mm -hmm. nothing um but like you know paying attention to some of the later cutscenes or the cutscenes that like fall later chronologically um he like if you're gonna read into his body language like he looks engaged He's like, uh, when when she's like playing with that frog, uh, trying to get him to eat that frog, she like, she gets down on hands and knees to look at the frog and he does too. Like he engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and then like you you read her diary like in the castle and she talks about like apparently he does open up to her like he does speak to her which like man that happens off screen <laughs> but yeah i just think it's like it is so interesting to me to have them be this like like it's so complicated um i i sort of view them as like especially in post game uh they like they have the potential to even be like a totally codependent like um like they are the only two people who have gone through the same trauma and understand what each other has gone through because there are so few living people from pre calamity i almost said pre pandemic because i'm so used to saying the phrase pre-pandemic. <laughs> Ew, pre-calamity um, um but like that it's 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 more crunchy to me it's more interesting mm-hmm. to me so i don't completely write off the idea of romance being involved but it just like it doesn't interest me and another facet of that is that like the idea of them romantically I can't extract Mifa from the formula. Like, Mifa is so, like, in my head plays such an important part of characterizing Link and characterizing Zelda. And, like, uh, probably not every viewer would see it that way because, like, we we really don't see Mifa interacting with the three of them much at all. We see, overwhelmingly, we see Link and Zelda interact or him, t- or her talking at him, basically. Um, and then... Mifa talking to Link individually and Mifa talking to Zelda individually. But just like this knowledge that uh, Mifa loves Link. She is in love with him and uh, we just don't know if it's requited. Maybe it used to be and he like fell deeper into depression. Maybe it was never requited. We just don't know. That is compelling my, to me. What's your read? My my read is it was re- it was it was requited. And that they were distinctly together. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, Link just doesn't have that left. Um, I, li- I like And that it's read. gone. And my reasoning behind that is she proposed. Mifa proposed to him. And oh, he... Ex- that's Yeah, thought, that's what I think the armor is. I thought canonically I, I, she wasn't able to do it. I thought that was part of the tragedy is that she was about to and wasn't able to because she got mm, kicked the bucket. I guess my read on that is more, um, it's a, maybe it's a modern read in the sense mm. of like, you don't, like, if we're reading her as not a spring a thing on a person in an unfair way or a, like, you want to talk about this sort of way, she was on, like, they were on the road to proposal mm-hmm. such that she finished making a whole suit of armor. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> So uh, my my read on that is that like yeah I think they were I think they were together, um, and that it's the tragedy for me is that Link doesn't really remember that and that I think the memories he gets back were picked magically for the sake of the world not for the sake of him. Yes. Um, and so it's I think I think it's all tragic and I. I, I would want, I would, like, if someone were to say Zelda and Link end up together, I'd be like, all right, I need three years. I need you to give me three years mm. between these two points, please. Um, yeah. Like, that's that's my, that's how I kind of feel about that. But all of that aside, I will say one other thing I really did like about the interesting dynamics is it does paint... Link is heroic in a more in a less grand way too. Of like, mm-hmm. oh, you get to know that this is a person who's willing to still put his life on the line for someone who has treated him pretty badly. Um, yeah, it does not seem I'm, nearly as arbitrary as it does in almost every other game. Yeah, yeah. Or it's more of like a just like this is we're going on a grand mission and there's someone to save at the end, but I don't know and we're just doing a cuss. Yeah. Um, and that's think- and that's all very well and good. <laughs> That Derek, is also, you've been I think, pretty the power quiet. Of, uh, oh, sorry. I was just going <laughs> to... <laughs> Go ahead, Clara. Part of the uh, power of the story, Wind Waker, is that his um, reason for becoming a hero is saving his sister. I think that's like, that's uh, a really interesting like narrative. That's all I was going to say. Go ahead, Derek. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's fine. I've, I've been really enjoying listening to the two of you talk about it. <laughs> like, compared to the two of you, I have such little Zelda knowledge, and I haven't done a lot of digging. I hope this isn't alienating uh, to you. <laughs> no, it's, inter- it's interesting because, like, like, 
because like when we were talking about memories and like the order of events like like I'll, I'll put it this way like i don't think link and zelda at the end of the game get together i think link by the end of the game in my every time i've been playing link i feel like link still very much kind of figures out that he like hasn't had time to mourn the loss of of uh, Mipha, yeah, mm. and, you know, like that's. I kind of think he ends up being just a lone boy at the end. Um, uh-huh. But that's also because, like, every time I've played, the first few memories I stumble upon are either like Link, like dying, or uh, or some of the memories with Mipha. Those mm-hmm. are like the, always the two memories that, I, like, two or three memories that I, I seem to stumble upon um, in like the playthroughs I've done, and I think like. It's 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 interesting to kind of like, yeah, because like the idea of like the memories serving the greater world, and this idea of like being this person that wakes up and has to like figure it out and like mm-hmm. make all these big decisions. It is ultimately like yeah, like like the world expects you to save it, but then yeah. like you kind of start doing things in as a player and as Link, you kind of realize I don't have to save it right now. The world's subsisting. It's surviving. Mm -hmm. I don't have to finish my heroic quest. And to me, that became the most interesting part of Link is the fact that you as the player control whether or not the world is saved. Like, for some, like, I, like, to, to kind of comment on your Elden Ring comment, Dane, I've found that I, I, I relate more to Link than I do my Elden Ring character. Ooh. Because mm. there's a, there's a bit more gravitas with the, Link can just walk away from all of this. If I put down my Switch and stop playing, mm. Link is taking, Link is walked away from stopping Ganon and, like, saving the world as, as, as he knew it. And that, to me, has so much more weight than, like, putting the pieces of the Elden Ring together. Um, See, uh, my interesting feeling is I have a similar feeling about um, about Elden Ring, actually, because for my my bit of not Zelda lore is that, like, this thing keeps repeating, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, the whole, like, uh, the Ganon-Zelda Link conflict keeps playing out over and over again. Yeah. And in Elden Ring, I'm like, oh, if I walk away, uh, I go become a hollow like anybody else. Mm. Um, and, and it's hard for me to sort of betray the, the will of like the imaginary person. Um, and uh, see, I, the, the choices presented in Elden Ring and how the, how the game ends gives me more relation to the person because mm. The only the the sweet, very almost like romantic read, not like I mean romantic in like the um, yeah. literary sense, not in like the roman. yeah <laughs> um, sense is that like you make a good point. Like the 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 high rule in Breath of the Wild is it's actually fine. Like some more than other, but yeah. some places more than others. But like yeah, the world ended, but also everybody's fine. The person who is not fine is the person making sure that it is fine, who is Zelda. Yes. yes. The world actually it, it doesn't need to be saved. And Link could walk away. And the romantic thing is that he chooses to do a much harder thing yes. to actually just save one person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's and powerful I... enough that it like it doesn't even matter if it is a uh, platonic or romantic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly individually yeah. between the two of them it's like amazing either way and 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 i think that's all great but like that's the story the story is you save for whatever reason you save the day in elden ring the fi- the thing that i find so engaging is that it, the the ending depends on your choices you can make things substantially worse or hopefully better or you get to perpetuate a status quo and i think that choice speaks a lot and then but the the things that really get me in that game are actually more subtle smaller story bits um on the pathway there um and i think that's i think that's interesting yeah no yeah I, i think it's it's definitely like a different style of gameplay, I think, for sure, and storytelling. I will say, um, you played Champions Ballad, right, Dane? No. The the, the DLC for yeah, I've not played the, the DLC for Breath of the Wild. 
for Breath of the Wild? No. Oh my you god, should... you gotta. Yeah, so so this was... <laughs> They patched the story, Dane. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so... <laughs> oh, they so, patched the story? So much yeah. better. Yeah, so so when I got Breath of the Wild, the first thing Clara told me was like, you have to get Champions yeah. Ballad right now. Isn't that the isn't that the, the endless dungeon? No, 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 that's the second no, no, no. First DLC. Um, the second DLC is much more story oriented. It's the uh, it's the one with the each champion has a shrine basically, and it unlocks additional memories. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I'm missing those. Yes. I guess sometime I will get around to that. Yeah, cause... you could either depending on how much time you have to devote to it, you could also just watch the cutscenes. Honestly, I could because I want to talk about them with you. Yeah, but I will say. <laughs> All right, here yeah. I will. I will. I will play. Here's the thing. How about this? Since we, we unfortunately have to wrap up, I will I will make a declarative promise right now. My promise is I will do a new playthrough of Breath of the Wild with this DLC, and we'll invite Clara back on to talk about it. Wow. How about that? Okay, there we go. Pretty big promise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got to hold you to it. <laughs> I will yep. say there was nothing that motivated me more for the final boss fight than finishing that DLC. Yeah. And... Up until that point, I was unsure if I wanted to do that final boss fight. It just as Link narratively. Mm. So, mm. but yeah, I mean, I think the beauty of like a game like like The Legend of Zelda and like that whole series is like because it's so like vague and broad, and there's so much repeatability and like like I guess repeatability in the sense of like it keeps happening over and over again so there's all this extra lore that mm-hmm. carries over from game to game it's like it's it's done what so many pieces of art hope to do which is create something that they can just like add on but still do the same thing you know mm-hmm. like it's it's that fine line of um reinventing itself every game that is like so beautiful <laughs> I feel sometimes about The Legend of Zelda, even being a more minor fan, and I'm curious what you think about this, Clara, I feel like I could tell a Legend of Zelda story properly Mm. in the same way that I feel like I could tell a Robin Hood story properly. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. It's like on on one hand, there is so much lore. There's decades worth of lore. There's decades worth of content. On the other hand, the stories just lend themselves to making your own understanding of them and like putting yourself into them. Mm -hmm. And that's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been writing my own Zelda Legend of Zelda fan script. Really? Yeah. I've been outlining it. That's been like, that's awesome. Yeah. Cause I, I've been really struggling to write like a fantasy adventure movie for a long time. And then I was like, wait, I love the Legend of Zelda, at least from this one experience. This is like a great world where everyone's doing fan art. Why don't I just write a fan script? Cause like, I love Link as like this, as like this, I I love Link as a heroic figure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I started working on that like a few months ago. You will be showing that to me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe when I finish it, we can do a read through of it on the pod. Ooh. You can yeah. big promises, yeah. big promises. I'll read the role of Link. Jk. Yes. Uh, I was gonna say today, Clara, you kind of have that climber Link outfit going. Oh my god, yeah, I have a bandana, bandana on and earrings. <laughs> I okay. You want to know something? It's even a little embarrassing. Or maybe it's not. The I'm wearing different earrings right now, but my usual earrings that I wear are little metal blue hoops because that's what Link wears. Oh, nice. I'm always oh, doing a little awesome. mini cosplay. <laughs> oh boy oh. well we've clearly got to talk about this more later yeah we, we do got to have you back on the show uh thank you so much clara this has been a really fun uh i guess for us few hours for the listeners few weeks um mm-hmm. yeah thanks guys. i have one complaint my god oh. one it's it's devastating. Okay. You guys get to hang out in person, and I'm a here. Yeah. Yeah. Clara lives 12 minutes away from me. Yeah. We got breakfast this morning, Dane. Breakfast together. We could go anywhere and get boba. We can go walking around parks. And what do you get? You get snow. You're gonna you're gonna do this to me right before I have to go study contracts. Yeah. You could have come. Gonna, you could have come this? to San Diego for law school, Dane. You could have only been two hours away. Dane, where are you going to be? Yeah. What do you mean? Hold Phys- on. Say, physically. Physically. Physically? Uh, in, it, like, right now? Or what? In what Actually, context? No. Rephrase. I'm going to be home in Colorado for um, Thanksgiving and Christmas break. Can I see you? Uh, Thanksgiving, yes. And probably some Christmas. 
Let's do it. There you go. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Then and you'll I'll be left out, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be alone. Actually, though, Derek, are you going to be in L.A. during, like, holidays? Uh, not this year, actually. So. Ah, dang. See, I'm coming out to L.A. I for know. some... I'll be Anyways. Yeah. <sighs> so either way, let me know when you're in L.A., though, because maybe there will be crossover. Yeah. But yeah, 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 I'll actually be seeing family for the first time in, like, three years for, for the holidays. Nice. So Love that. I'm excited. I get to have my annual basketball game with my brother, Aww. and he's going to kick my ass. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But anyhow, thank you, Clara. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be an extremely chatty person, which is sort of my default state. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it was very refreshing. I got to do what I did for most of the early podcast days, which is just listen, which is nice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really nice way of saying yeah. that I monopolized a lot of the time. No. He's okay. also quietly saying that I talk a lot. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I always, whenever I'm editing the podcast, I always edit myself out the most because oh. I find myself to be the least interesting part of the show. But see, oh, see, here's the thing. I did a lot of that in, in when I was editing up my podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started being the, 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 the game master and I realized I couldn't. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is and the I was curse mad. of being a game master. It is master. the curse. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, obviously, podcast, every word out of my mouth has been gold. Yes. Edited Hell out yeah. at your own risk. Yeah. Yeah. Just kidding. You're the it's only your reason why we're going to continue to have five stars. Derek, on Derek, you cannot... You cannot do this to the talent. I cannot do this to the talent. I'm sorry. No. Every <laughs> word. <laughs> Man, that'd be funny. What if we replaced you, Dane, for an episode? It's like the ending of 22 Jump Street where they're like, and for contractual issues, Seth Rogen and some other actor is going to play Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill. That's sort of really what? obscure reference. What? what? Old... They did that? In the end credits, they were like parodying, like, we're going to make sequels of the 22 Jump Street. So they did like 23 Jump Street, Jump Street. Oh, origins jump through in space okay. and one of them in one of the sequels they replace one of them with someone else and they make okay. no comment about oh it oh my god and gotcha it's like, it's okay like a all funny right funny bit joke i'll send you both the link it's so obscure but it's burned into my memory anyway clara on the internet <laughs> and just in general like where can people see what you're doing oh well if you search Clara Horst into most of the main socials, uh, you will find me. Um, I'm on Twitter uh, for now. Um, I'm on <laughs> Tumblr. I'm on Instagram. Um, those are the main ones that I post on. Um, my my username is usually Icosa, I C O S A, but um, it's a little inconsistent across websites. So just search Clara Horst. And where can we watch We Baby Bears? On HBO Max. Great. Everyone for go now. watch that show. And <laughs> for now. Click that like button. Smash that Ugh. like button so HBO Max knows. Capitalism is bad. Yeah, capitalism is <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a good button. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Clara. And yeah, now we can go tell Dane to go study. Go I have to study. Go study. I have to go study capitalism, the law class. Ugh. Ugh. This professor's so good, though. Like, he almost has me convinced to take corporations. I, you know what you should do, Dane? You should start what? making your legal name Dane C. Fogdahl Esquire, and then it should be. You want you want, Then you should be like, you know what? You want to know what the C stands for? Capitalism. Oh. <laughs> Instead of your actual legal middle name. Well, or corporations. If you become a corporate lawyer. If I fall to the dark side, at least I'll get a sweet red lightsaber. At least. And then you'll get to read all that Raylo fan fiction. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.